selection of the songs that you have uh, led us in throughout this gospel meeting so far have been right on target with the thoughts that uh, I want to present, and I appreciate that more than you know. Someone has said that with good singing, good praying, even good announcements, you can get by with mediocre preaching. Well, we don't have the desire to do that tonight. We want to examine the text and see what it says and uh, do so accurately. Thank you for being here. We have some that are visiting with us from Lancaster. Thrilled that you're here. Uh, you're obviously gluttonous for punishment. We're glad you're here anyway uh, to hold up our hands in the things that we're trying to do in this meeting. It's good to see Brother Jeff Beard and his wife with us tonight. I went to school with Jeff a long time ago. We were talking about how long that was. I said, well, that was about 50 years ago. He said, well, it was 48. And I said, well, when you get to be our age, you can round off. So anyway, we'll round off for the, the smaller end of that. In our study tonight, we have examined for a number of lessons a text beginning in Romans chapter 3. I would invite you to open your Bibles to that once again as we study it together. Romans chapter 3. We have noted in this text that the writer has identified that man cannot be justified by the works of the law. In verse 20, he said, Because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for through the law cometh the knowledge of sin. If man is to be right before the Lord, then there's two ways to do that. Never sin. And the writer here says, you don't do that. You don't do that. And in verse 23, the point is that all have sinned. So there's not anybody that saved the Lord that has accomplished that. Then if we're going to be made right before God, how is that ever going to be accomplished? Well, we know beginning in verse 22, the writer says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Unto all them that believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to show His righteousness because of the passing over of the sins done aforetime in the forbearance of God. For the showing, I say, of His righteousness at this present season, that he might himself be just and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. Now hold your finger there. We're eventually going to come back to this text. But I want to call your attention to this point. One of the things that we know in this text is that all have sinned. And if anybody is going to be made right before God, it's going to be by God's grace through the redemption that is offered in the sacrifice of Jesus. The word propitiation, frankly, is not a word I use every day, but it simply means a sin offering or an offering for atonement. And through that offering, we have the privilege of being forgiven of our sins. Now, in our studies thus far, we have talked about redemption. We have talked about reconciliation. And we have talked about justification. And in our study tonight, we want to talk about the subject of sanctification. Now that's going to call upon us to go back and review just a little bit, but while I have this passage on the board, I want to get it. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, a very important passage to our study. We wound up with this in our study last night, and we noted that in the city of Corinth, it was known, or in the uh, ancient world, the city of Corinth was known for its vile wickedness, for the base debauchery that characterized humanity at the time, and to Corinthian eyes was a known expression. Well, let's read in verse uh, 9 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and see the kind of things that characterized these people and their past. He said, Or know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye were washed, but ye were sanctified, but ye were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. We see some of the terms that we've been discussing in this series of lessons used in this passage. But to identify what they were, look at the immoralities in which they engaged. 
The ancient world was not altogether different from the world that we live in, was it? We see immoral practices in the world that we live in, and some that are very shocking to us. And, of course, the, the mores of society seem to be leaning to accept that as, as an established practice or at least a justifiable practice. But here's what they did. And the writer said, You know that no unrighteous person shall inherit the kingdom of God. Suppose we examine how they knew that or speculate just a little. Well, you see, we don't have to speculate because we know. In Acts the 18th chapter, the apostle Paul went into the city of Corinth and he preached Christ. And when he preached Christ crucified in the city of Corinth, how did they respond to it? They heard what he preached. They believed what he preached. And verse 8 of Acts 18 tells us that they were baptized. Here are those who heard the gospel and they responded to it and they changed the way that they lived. Now here's the, pro the problem. Some of the things that they were doing are the very same things that people are doing today. And we look at those round about us who practice these things and we say, well, n nobody from that kind of a background would be interested in the gospel. They were. The gospel was to be preached to every creature and included, included those who were practicing sinful things as we see identified specifically in this text. This is what they were. What does that tell us, dear brethren? It tells us that these in Corinth were accountable to God, were they not? They needed the gospel because they were guilty of sin. And the gospel was the means by which they might be saved. Now we've talked about that rather extensively thus far in our study. But does that mean then because we have come out of this kind of a background that those kind of temptations are no longer temptations to us at all? Well, no. How do we know that? Back up one chapter in 1 Corinthians to chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the writer said, it is actually reported that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not even among the Gentiles that one of you hath his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and did not rather mourn that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I, verily being absent in body, but present in spirit, have already, as though I were present, judged him that has so wrought this thing. In the name of our Lord Jesus, ye being gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory in is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, even as ye are unleavened. Now drop down in that text to verse 9. He said, I wrote unto you in my epistle to have no company with fornicators, not at all meaning with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous and extortioners, and, or with idolaters. For then ye must needs go out of the world. But as it is, I wrote unto you, not to keep company if any man that is named a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one no not to eat now pause there and put all that together this was their background this laundry list of things that he identifies in these verses this is what they used to do but he said you can't live that way anymore but there's one at least among you who is living that way. And I wrote to you not to keep company if any man be named a brother who is living like this. Who's living like all of you used to live. You can't continue that way of life. Again, dear brethren, don't we see that? The writer said you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just a very quick review. We talked about redemption, what it is, what was the purchase price, and who it is that paid that price, for whom redemption is provided. And we noted, contrary to the doctrine of Calvinism, redemption is offered to everyone. And then this very important point, where is redemption? Well, we noted that redemption is offered in Christ. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through verse 7. Well, then the question that becomes apparent when are we redeemed? The purchase price has been paid, but the actual deliverance takes place when you're buried with him in baptism, raised to walk a new life. Now, as we discussed reconciliation in our study on Sunday evening, 
We noted that the word of reconciliation was given unto the apostles. And the apostle Paul said, We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be ye reconciled. Well, the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation was delivered. And they're commanded to be reconciled. Well, what is it? It's to be brought back into a right relationship with God. Who reconciles us? Well, we noted that we're reconciled by the blood of Jesus. So the right reality of that is, it is Jesus that reconciles us. Well, for whom was reconciliation provided? It's provided for everyone. But then where is reconciliation? It's found in Christ, in that relationship, not outside of it. And then when are we reconciled? We're reconciled when we enter into that relationship. And again, we underscore when we are baptized into his death and are forgiven of our sins. In our study last night, we talked about justification. What it is, we noted that it's a legal term that simply means to be set free, allowed to go free, or acquittal is a word that we might use to define that word. Who justifies us? Well, it's Jesus that does that through his blood, through the sacrifice on the cross. For whom is justification provided? We talked about that and noted that justification is offered to everyone, but not everyone is reconciled, or not everyone is justified. Again, the reason why. Where is justification? Well, it's found in Christ, in this relationship. And then when are we justified? We're set free when we're baptized into his death. And it's there that his blood washes our sins away. Now to our point tonight. When we look at this context of passage or verses, we know what these folks used to be. And they were washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Question, does that mean they can continue the same practices that they had before? Well, the obvious answer to that is no. All men everywhere must repent. That's obvious, and we read that from Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. Repentance involves a change, a change of mind that results in a change of practice. This idea of being sanctified, again, needs definition. I appreciated Jerry when he was talking with me about songs uh, to sing tonight regarding sanctification. And uh, we began to talk about that, or at least Tom did with him, especially regarding some specific songs that we have sung tonight. That word sanctification comes to us from a word that's simply translated holy in passages that we're going to look at somewhat tonight. Holy. Now, that simply means to separate from those things that are common or those things that are, are profane. To purify by expiation, to free from the guilt of sin, Strong's tells us. Now, when we look at the definition of this word, we need to see how the word is used. Now, this is not altogether a word study, but in doing studies like this, it's good to look at where the word is used and note the context, isn't it? To get an idea of how the word is used. Turn your Bible, if you will, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Just the mention of that chapter brings to your mind the controversy or the rebuke, rather, of Jesus to the Jews in the city of Jerusalem as he repeatedly referred to them as scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Now drop down in that text, if you will, to verse 16. Verse 16. Jesus said, Woe unto you, ye blind guides that say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now let's pause and examine their argument. Their argument was that if we swear by the gold that's within the temple, then we're duty bound to do what we promised to do. But if we swear by the temple itself, then maybe we can worm our way out of it and not really have to do what we said we would do. You ever wonder why he calls them hypocrites? Look at verse 17. Ye fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that hath sanctified the gold? Now just by the asking of the question, you see the obvious answer. What makes the gold in the temple special? It was where it was. It was sanctified by the temple. Drop down in that text to the very next verse. It says, And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gift that is upon it, he is a debtor. Get their argument. 
You see, if I swear by the altar, I really don't have to do it. But if I swear by the gift that is upon the altar, then somehow I'm duty bound. I must do that. Again, he said, ye blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? He therefore that sweareth by the altar sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And he that sweareth by the temple sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that sweareth by the heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Now he's answered their argument, but our word is sanctified or sanctifieth in these verses. The point is that which is within or withon is sanctified by the altar or by the temple. It's set apart. It's made special by that temple or altar as the case may be. Look if you will at 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4. We'll not look at all of these just in case you're wondering, but we want to get an idea of how the word is used. We know in 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, But the Spirit saith expressly that in latter times some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons through the hypocrisy of men that speak lies, branded in their own conscience as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. Now look at verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be rejected if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. What makes food that God has created worthy to be received? God has set it apart and made it worthy. And one other illustration, if you like, we'll note in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and in verse 14, the writer says, Evidently these in Corinth had questions regarding what constituted the real marriage. In other words, if you're married to somebody that is not a Christian, are you really married? Is that a real marriage? And Paul answers that. In verse 12 he said, But to the rest I say, not I but the Lord, if any brother hath an unbelieving wife, and she is content to dwell with him, let him not leave her. And the woman that hath an unbelieving husband, and he is content to dwell with her, let her not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the in the brother. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. What's the writer say? The fact of whether or not you're married to somebody that is or is not a Christian does not nullify whether or not you're married. You are married. The unbelieving party is sanctified because you're married. You're set apart. Or else your children are unholy, or we would use the term illegitimate. What do we want to note about the use then of this term sanctification? It's used to talk about that which is set apart, that which is separate, that which is holy. And we're going to look at that as our study progresses. We note that the consecration of the Son by the Father, Jesus devoting himself to the redemption of the people, the setting apart of the believer for God. And that's a text we'll come back to perhaps a bit later. The separation of the apostles. Another text that we want to come back to in just a bit. In John the 17th chapter, Jesus in his prayer for the apostles called upon the Father to set them apart. To sanctify them. To sanctify them in truth. He said, thy word is true. What would make the apostles different? Well, what is it that makes you different from the Word? Is it not your allegiance to what God says? The Word that Jesus gave unto the apostles was what was to make them different. And we're going to see the application of that to you and me as we follow along in our study. The believer who has turned away from things that dishonor God, he is set apart. The acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ. We sometimes look at this passage uh, as we talk about defense of the gospel. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Being ready always to give an answer to any man that asks you a reason concerning the hope that is within you, yet with meekness and fear. What does he mean when he says sanctify Christ as Lord? Well, he's the master. You recognize that. You set him apart as that. 
Jesus implicated that in, in uh, Luke chapter 6 in verse 46 when he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you don't do the things that I say. If you sanctify him as Lord, you do what he says. You recognize his authority. Again, a simple passage. When we look again at this word, it's the root of this word from which we get our word sanctify or saint. And we want to call our attention then to the text of 1 Corinthians once again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, as this letter is addressed to the church of God, which is at Corinth, even them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all the call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place, their Lord and ours. Now, my dear friends, when the apostle addressed this letter to those who are saints in Corinth, did he address it to people who are alive or people who are dead? I ask that question tongue-in-cheek, as you know. But in today's world, there are those who have been dead for a period of time and been voted on by a particular organization for the worthy deeds that supposedly they have done, and then they can wear the title of being a saint. You see, that's not the Bible, is it? This letter was addressed to people who could read this epistle. It was addressed to the saints, those who were set apart to belong unto the Lord. Now let's use the same basic approach that we have in other studies. Who or what sanctifies us? Let's open our Bibles to the Hebrew letter and note with me in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, we'll just note verse 12. In Hebrews 13, verse 12, the writer said, Wherefore Jesus also he might sanctify the people through his own blood and suffered without the gate. And there are a lot of thoughts that are expressed in that that we'll not go into. We're just looking at the point. Who sanctifies us? Jesus does by his blood. Well, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Well, how? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading beginning in verse 13, the writer said, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, for that God chose you from the beginning unto salvation and sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you through our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye were taught, whether by word or by epistle of ours. Now, dear friends, as we read this context, we certainly see that the Holy Spirit is the agent of our sanctification. But let's ask the question, how? How does the Holy Spirit set us apart? Somebody says, well, it's about this time that you start hearing the Twilight Zone song. It's something mystical, something I feel, something you just can't explain. It's something that the Holy Spirit does to us. No. No, read the text. The Holy Spirit does sanctify us, but the text tells us how. We are called through our gospel, Paul writes, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is it then that the Holy Spirit makes us different, sets us apart? Dear friends, it's through what he teaches us. There's not anything mystical about it. We don't have to hear the twilight zone playing in the background. We read the text. You do this. This is what the Holy Spirit has revealed to us for us to do. Keep in mind that Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles who would guide them into all the truth. What did they do when they received it? We've been talking about those in Corinth. If you'll drop down to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and begin reading in verse 1. Just to briefly paraphrase it, Paul said, I preached it. Is that about getting it? I preached it. What else did he do with it? Well, turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3 and let's read what the writer says. Ephesians chapter 3, reading beginning in verse 3. He said, how that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. Would it be a very brief paraphrase to say when Paul received these things of the Holy Spirit, not only did he preach it, but according to this text, he wrote it down. 
Now, what do you do with it? What did the Corinthians do with it? When they heard it, they believed it, and they were baptized. They understood it, didn't they? What do you do with it when you read it? Paul said you can read it, you can understand it. When you understand it, then what do you do? You do what it says. What does that do for you? It makes you different. In what ways? You see, the old man passed away. All things have become new. Well, is that something mystical? Well, evidently it's not because of the warning that we see given to those in Corinth not to go back and live like you used to live, which seems to be a theme in all of the epistles, doesn't it? Don't go back and live like you used to. Now, dear friends, one of the things that I am seeing, even among some gospel preachers, is the contention that you can't read this book and make the changes that God wants you to make. Now, dear friend, if you take the position that you can't make the changes that God wants you to make unless the Holy Spirit does something mystical to you, you're not far away from teaching the same doctrine that John Calvin taught. You can't understand it without some mystical operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not so. The Word of God, dear friend, is powerful. In James chapter 1, it still says, Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Will it still do that? Will this same revealed word change the way you live? Or does God have to do something supernatural to you in order to constitute this sanctification, this separation from this old life of sin? Does there have to be some new way of appealing to you? Something that you just can't explain, but you know it's there. Something that you feel is true, but you can't show a passage of Scripture. But let's turn our Bibles to a passage once again. I mentioned John 17. In verse 8, Jesus said unto the Father in his prayer, For the words which thou gavest me I have given unto them. And they received them and knew of a truth that I came forth from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. What convinced them of that? The words that I gave them. They knew this. Well, what else do we learn? Dropping down to verse 14. He said, I have given them thy word. And the world hateth them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them from the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Well now, with the word of God that he had given to Jesus, and Jesus had delivered unto the apostles, would it make them different? Would it set them apart? Well, he's said what he's praying for. Will it do the same thing for you? Read what Jesus prayed for for you. In verse 20, he said, Neither for these only do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Well, that same word that Jesus gave unto the apostles, that same word that they preached, will it make you different? Will it separate you from your sins? Will it? It'll sanctify you because the word is, is powerful, you see. Look in your Bibles once again, the first Thessalonians chapter 4. We could read this whole chapter, but I want to make a point on just a few of the verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, Finally then, brethren, we beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that ye, or as ye received of us, how ye ought to walk, and to please God even as ye do walk, that ye abound more and more. Now this walk that he's talking about, would it be proper simply to ask or say that he's talking about how you live your life? Want you to walk in such a way as to please God. Want you to abound in that walk. Look at verse 2. For ye know what charge we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication, 
that each one of you know how to possess himself of his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust, even as the Gentiles who know not God, that no man transgress and wrong his brother in the matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As also we forewarned you and testified, for God called us not for uncleanness, but in sanctification. Therefore, he that rejecteth, rejecteth not man, but God, who giveth his Holy Spirit unto you. Now read again, read carefully the text. How did the ancient Gentile world live? Well, ungodly and immorally, like those that we read about in Corinth. The city of Thessalonica, as far as their moral standard was concerned, was not any different from Corinth or Athens or any other ancient city. This characterized the practice of idolatry. But what is it that Paul is urging them to do? How are they to live? Don't live like the world. Why? Because God has called you into sanctification or in sanctification. You're to live a different kind of life of life. Ephesians 4 has kind of become a go-to passage for me to illustrate this point. I want to call your attention to this passage as well. What circumstances existed in the city of Corinth when Paul came there? Well, you go back to Acts 19 and you can read about the kind of idolatrous city that it was and the practice of sorcery and various forms of immorality as we'll see in this letter written to the church in Ephesus. But in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, Paul writes, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk. Kind of sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4, don't it? Don't live like you used to live. In the vanity, he says, of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling gave themselves up to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye did not so learn Christ. Pause that and ponder that for just a moment. You did not so learn Christ. When Paul came into the city of Ephesus, what did he teach them? Much like those in Corinth, this is the way you used to live, but don't you know you can't continue to live that way? You must change the way you live. Somebody said, well, what did the, the Ephesians do? Well, I suggest to you, just keep reading. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away falsehood, speak ye truth, each one with his neighbor. Sounds like <coughs> that they had a history of being liars. That'd be about right. And if you read just a little bit further, he said, be angry and sin not. Sounds like they had anger issues too, don't it? Well, read some more. He says in verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he might have whereof to give to him that hath need. Sounds kind of like they had a problem with folks not wanting to work, don't it? Well, as you read just a little further in verse 29, let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth. Sounds like they had a problem with the words that they said and with the things they talked about. Filthy language, don't it? Well, as you read just a little bit further, look at verse 31. He said, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and railing be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. Now he's describing the way that they used to live in these previous verses. But now we've got a problem right here among them. This has now become their practice again in his writing to them and saying, don't live like you used to live. Isn't that simple? Don't go back and live like that again. Now just to illustrate a point, I had the opportunity some time ago to talk with a man that was about my age, maybe a little bit older. And he and his wife just bickered and fought all the time. And they invited me to come. Now, I don't like these circumstances, but they invited me to come talk to them, help, help them with their problem. And I asked the question, do you find yourselves every once in a while having a disagreement come up? And then that disagreement turns into kind of a yow-yow match. You're just fussing at each other. 
And then before long, your voices are getting louder and, and then you ended up by just yelling and screaming and nobody's listening to anybody. He kind of chuckled and he said, yeah, we do that all the time. Well, would it surprise you if they're having troubles? You see, this point has an application even within your home. These folks were Christians. They professed to be Christians. But look at the writer. He said, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and rage be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. You mean in the, the, the city of Ephesus, we've got folks that used to live not telling the truth, stealing, not working, and using their mouth to create dissension among folks. And, and now we've still got the temptation to do this so that Paul said, don't go back and live like the gentle. We've got this in, in the church. Well, it was in the world, wasn't it? And it's been my experience that anything that exists in the world for any length of time begins to creep its way into the Lord's church, don't it? And isn't that just exactly what happened in Ephesus? Now you look at our world, is it really all that different from theirs? You see why we talk about sanctification? It's not something that happens just at one point in your life and now your ticket is punched, you can do what you want to do. These in Ephesus had been sanctified by the blood of Christ, but they're being tempted to go back and live like they used to live. Those in Corinth are referred to as being saints, but look at how they used to live and now the warning about going back and living like you used to live and even at the present, tolerating fornication among themselves. Someone said, we don't ask and you don't tell. We don't know about anything you're doing. Somebody some time ago was upset with a group of elders because they led the congregation to withdraw from this individual because of their adultery. And her criticism was, what I do at home is my business. What I do in the church building is their business. What I do at home is none of their business. Really? You think Paul understood it quite that way? You see, to be sanctified, it's not something that you just say, well, I can do that once and my ticket is punched. It's all over, done, well, and good. No. Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's not on the chart, but it's going to be 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 15, the writer said, But like as he who called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. Because it is written, ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Now what is it that Peter is commanding in this passage? You live a sanctified life. You live a life of separation from the world. You don't go back and live like the world. Now yes, we can look at Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, on down through the rest of that chapter. And perhaps it would be good for us to just mention some of the things from it. In Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, he asked them the question, Know ye not that to whom ye present yourselves as servants unto obedience, his servants ye are, whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But, thanks be to God, that whereas ye were servants of sin, ye became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, whereunto ye were delivered and being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Now here's where the change took place. Here's where you initially were sanctified when you were baptized into Christ. But he said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye presented your members as servants unto uncleanness and to iniquity unto unto iniquity, even so now present your members as servants to righteousness unto sanctification. You see, just getting your ticket punched, your sins redeemed or forgiven or washed or justified in times gone by, that don't punch your ticket all the way into heaven, does it? You need to continue to live a sanctified life in your continuance in your obedience to the gospel. Now, dear friend, we talk about 
the grace that God has provided. You know, Tom and I both are aware of some who are saying, well, we just we don't preach on grace enough. We, we've neglected grace over here. I don't believe that at all. I just don't believe that. Some say, well, you just preach on condition, 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 and you don't preach on God's grace. Well, we need to know about God's grace because, dear friend, if it were not for the God's, God's grace, meeting conditions wouldn't do you a bit of good, not even a little bit. You see, God bestows his grace when we meet the conditions that he set forth, just like we've studied in our previous lessons. You benefit from the blood of Jesus. When you do what he tells you to do. Isn't that simple dear brethren? <laughs> and we become the one then. That chooses to obey or to disobey. God's grace is seen in the blood of Jesus clearly. But God's grace is combined with man's faith. And obedience to what God says. And we discussed last night. The element of trust involved in that. To do what he says. Now for whom is sanctification provided? Well, our text here has identified those who have chosen in time past to be servants of sin. But now they have chosen to be servants of righteousness. So to answer the question, all who need freedom or separation from sin, sanctification is provided. But where is sanctification? This privilege of being set apart well, we know that as Paul writes to those in Ephesus once again, the fifth chapter, he says, Husband, love the wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. What is it that is sanctified? What is this sanctified body? Well, that's the church. The church is that sanctified, forgiven justified, redeemed, reconciled body. It belongs to him. Now when does that sanctification begin? With the washing of water with the word. My dear brethren and friends, I'm persuaded that this passage is talking about when we're baptized in Christ, just like other passages that we've used in our study thus far. Those in Corinth were washed, justified, and sanctified. When did that occur? When they heard, believed, and were baptized into the body of Christ. That's when that occurred. Now when are we sanctified? Well, the scriptures teach us, for in one spirit were we all baptized into one body. It was that one body that Jesus added the saved to in Acts chapter 2. In the Galatian letter, we're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, if sanctification is in Christ, then when we're baptized into Christ, we enjoy that relationship. These in Corinth were washed, justified, and sanctified through their obedience to the gospel when they were baptized into Christ. So when does that occur? Well, it occurs when you obey the gospel. When you hear it believe and are baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. But dear friend, it doesn't stop there. For you're raised to walk a new life, different kind of life, and caution not to go back and live the old life ever again. Put the old man to death, raised to walk a new life. Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Now, dear friend, that's our question tonight. Are you sanctified by the blood of Jesus? Are you set apart by the blood of Jesus? You see, if you've not been baptized into Christ, then you're yet in the world, condemned under the condemnation of your sin. If you have obeyed the gospel, being baptized into Christ, your sins can be forgiven. You can be redeemed, justified. All these words we've been using. But that doesn't mean that your ticket is forever punished. The Lord expects you to live a different kind of life. And that's what I hope that we've seen in our study this evening. The apostle writing to the young preacher Timothy said, If a man therefore purge himself from thee, you can go back and look at the context and see what it was that he identified in those previous verses. He says, He shall be a vessel unto honor, 
sanctified, mean for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. That's what you want, isn't it? That's what you want tonight. Maybe I'm talking to someone in the audience tonight who desire to obey the gospel. Time and opportunity is yours. <coughs> Would you believe that he is who he claims to be? Turn from your sin in repentance. Confess your faith and be baptized to wash away your sins by the blood of Jesus. Maybe you've done that. You need to give some more attention to the way you're living. We can help you with that by praying with you before you to that end. And please make it known while together we stand, while we sing this song.